Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Trinity, one in essence and undivided. Well, hello. Welcome to our first session, episode one of the Mystagogic Liturgy. This is going to be a journey as we begin making our way towards discovering uh, what all is taking place during the Divine Liturgy of the Orthodox Faith. Uh, let me say at the beginning, uh, we, this will probably end up being about 12 episodes. We'll see, we'll move at the speed of the group and we'll see if we can kind of keep that pace, but uh, we won't drag it out any longer than <laughs> it takes for us to be able to go through this at the pace of the group. Uh, let me say that we have a rough draft of the material we will be discussing that you will find it easier perhaps to follow along with. It has the citations, the footnotes, the biblical references and so forth that you will find helpful and useful. Uh, you will discover that this is a rough draft. In order to have it available to us, uh, we had to rush getting it printed so that the copies are available directly from Amazon.com or through the church here uh, when we meet for our sessions on Monday evenings. We'll have some available that you can purchase here. Uh, so you'll notice that it's rough. We hope that after we have finished, we will then make the corrections to the roughness. There may be some deletions, some additions, so that then we will have a, a clean that will then replace this at Amazon.com. So you, with that word of caution, I, I would urge you to get a, a copy of the book to follow along. I also need to say that this study uh, is, is part of a larger process of all of the studies and seminars that we've done here at St. Elijah over the last, uh, gosh, since uh, the year 2000 and the beginning of Finding the Church Jesus Built through all of the different seminars we've held and the different books that have come into existence. Uh, the, the books are written to be taught in a seminar and so they become a living journey. Uh, they are the results of a journey made to get to a conclusion that then we share with you so that you might make the same journey and know how we got here and have access to the material itself should you seek to go and verify it so that it becomes your journey to get to the same destination and decide what you wish about the outcome of our journey together. Having said that, every class, every seminar in its beginning has to have an entry level point and uh, the, the lower the entry level then the more accessible the material is going to be that we can then get on board and then begin to make the ascent of the journey together. Uh, I must caution us that this study, the mystagogic liturgy, does not start at ground zero, but is a, a higher starting point assuming some already growth on your part uh, in your own journey of faith and understanding. And, and so, in, in a very real sense, having finished our study of the Apocalypse of John and coming to uh, Volume 3, uh, of the study together when we get to what is chapter 21 
in the uh, book of Revelation we come to the new Jerusalem uh, the, the text there in the book of Revelation that says, speaks of there will be a new Jerusalem a new heaven and a new earth and a new Jerusalem and so we have then the chapters uh, the new Jerusalem uh, Abraham an immigrant living in the land of promise one and living in the land of promise two and in many ways it is in coming to and understanding the new Jerusalem as the church that has come down from heaven as it were that where God is in our midst and there is no longer a temple uh, as in the old days in Jerusalem uh, in many ways then if with that is where the book of Revelation ends it then brings us to the church and the liturgy in the church so in many ways uh, we could have almost put the last two or three chapters of the apocalypse here uh, with then this book our mystagogic liturgy and would have made uh, perhaps a, a, a more gentle introduction and so forth so I, I call that to our attention and then finally let me also bring to our attention uh, a previous study that we did that we've never yet had the opportunity to video and place online uh, let's talk church introduction to mystagogic worship this is a nice introductory level uh, for anyone to begin and while the, the mystagogic liturgy is a continuation of a journey through the book of, uh, of Revelation and this is could be a, a volume one a gentle introduction for beginners if you will also available directly from amazon.com uh, and then this would be volume two that would take us into a a deeper understanding and level of what's going on so I, I just give that to you to resources available to you that uh, you could perhaps use and will be benefit you as we begin our journey together let me remind us something that Vladimir Lossky said the spirit which inspires him who teaches must be found in those who listen else they will hear nothing orthodox thinking occurs on three levels there is let me get my markers out there is the literal level of the words themselves the literal level there is also then the allegorical level where there is something behind the words that is also present in what is being said now some people make the allegorical just a version of the literal x equals y this stands for that uh, that's still literal allegorical is beginning to look for that which is uh, left unsaid in what is being said uh, maybe you, you're familiar with watching in movies where a subtext happens often in a conversation in a romantic setting uh, between a man and a woman where whatever is being said on the literal level has a different kind of meaning on the subtext level perhaps a like that so we mean there's a in terms of grade school this would be for the beginners 
this begins to be the intermediate level uh, of understanding what's going on. And then finally we have the mystagogic. In uh, our series on the Gospel of John, John the Mystagogic Gospel, we spent a uh, considerable amount of time at the beginning introducing the mystagogic and the, mystag the mystagogic period in the life of the church from the resurrection through Pentecost, the period of mystagogy uh, in the life of the church. This would be the advanced level where we are beginning to get then into uh, experiencing the experience that is causing the words to have uh, been written in the first place. In our study together, we're going to begin learning how to get from the literal through the allegorical to the mystagogic. So that then we're going to be learning how to go from here to the mystagogic. Uh, in a sense, we're going to be in training so that then when we get to part two and look at the divine liturgy itself, you'll be able to be dealing with understanding the liturgy on the mystagogic level as opposed to just the literal and the allegorical. So part one is going to be the largest part. It's going to be take us longer, but it will be a training then to be able to move us from literal, from grade school into uh, high school, and then into the university level, if you will, of our thinking, uh, whatever labels you want to put on the three different labels, uh, three different levels that occur. So in order to experience the fullness of the divine liturgy, we must learn to think orthodox. So our part one, as I've indicated, is going to be learning how to think allegorical and mystagogic. Part two is going to be then a discussion and experience of the divine liturgy itself. The better we learn how to think orthodox, the better we are prepared to experience the divine liturgy. We can experience the divine liturgy on all three levels. But if we are to experience the mystagogic level, mystagogic liturgy on the mystagogic level, let us discover the mystagogic level of thinking in the Orthodox faith. Which brings us then to the beginning of part one, the mystagogic hermeneutic, learning how to think orthodox. I think we're on page seven of the book, at least the rough draft version, if you're following along. The divine liturgy exists in part as a written text. Words can carry different meanings and understandings. Written texts are therefore subject to different interpretations from different people. Uh, just pass the Bible around and ask people their different understandings of a verse or different denominations understanding of verses and you get what we mean. The issue of interpretation comes into play with a written text. People with a Western perspective view things differently from those from an Eastern perspective. Before we discuss the divine liturgy, we must first discuss the basic principles of interpretation. Interpretation is known as hermeneutics, that big fancy word, hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is the study of the principles used in interpretation of written text. What principle are you using to interpret this text? The divine liturgy of Orthodox Christianity 
as we said, exist in part in written form. Interpretations of the text of the divine liturgy, therefore, can fall into three separate categories, the literal, the allegorical, and the mystagogy. Before discussing the mystagogic level, we will first introduce the subject of hermeneutics, the subject of interpretations in the first place and principles. And that will bring us then to chapter one in our book, page nine. Hermes and Newton's apple. Sir Isaac Newton created his gravitational theory 1665 to 1666 when he saw an apple fall from a tree. He asked what made the apple fall straight rather than falling sideways or even falling upward. Newton witnessed an everyday occurrence, but on this one particular day, the falling apple got his attention, which is to say he attended to it. He gave his attention to it. He paid attention and saw what he had never seen before in this event, which is to say Newton attended to a falling apple and apprehended that which invisibly took place. Newton attended and witnessed something invisibly taking place in the visible falling of an apple. You see, we cannot see gravity. We can't see it. Newton then sought to describe, that is to put into words, that which he apprehended, that which he now saw gravity doing. That is to say, Newton then sought to comprehend, put into words, what he had seen invisibly taking place. The result was the creation of Newton's gravitational theory of the universe. There was a visible apple in the act of falling. There was Newton attending, apprehending, paying attention to what he saw. Newton translated his experience into words. He expressed his experience in verbal concepts, a linguistic understanding known now as Newton's gravitational theory of the universe. On the basic level of an experience being translated into words, that translation is a hermeneutic. There was a, how do you translate what he saw, apprehended, into words? That's an, it's an interpretation of an experience being described now in words. The same as interpreters at the United Nations translate what a speaker says into the languages of the listeners, Newton became an interpreter, announcing to others what the falling apple had said. Translating a communication into another language makes the experience 
which created or inspired the communication in the first place makes that experience knowable in a different language. Well, that brings us on page 9 to Newton's Newtonian nonsense. In an age when only the empirical apple is said to exist, everything said above, I have just said, is nonsense. After all, apples do not talk. Yet, without Newton's gravitational theory of the universe, there would never have been human footprints on the moon. Newton witnessed the apple fall in 1665 or 1666. It was over 20 years later that Newton was able to translate what the apple said to him in, 18, in 1666 when he finally published the Principia. Newton's translation of what the apple said when it fell was that quote everybody in the universe is attracted to every other body with a force that is directly proportional to the product of their masses and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. <laughs> I got to confess, if the purpose of an interpreter said in one language, understandable in the language of the listener, whose language is different from the first, then Newton failed to make his translation of a falling apple understandable to me. <laughs> I don't know what Newton just said. However, Newton's audience spoke the same language as Newton. They understood what Newton said that the apple had said. Remember how we began with our quote from Lasky? The spirit who inspires him who teaches must be found in those who listen, else they will hear nothing. I heard nothing, obviously, that spirit of physics does not abide in me but the spirit that was speaking with Newton, through Newton, was abiding in his scientific audience. That brings us then on page 10 to a brief excursus on Hermes. A brief excursus on Hermes. Let me clear our board here, just in case we need to try to visually make certain things more clear. In order to understand what happened after Newton translated what the apple said into scientific jargon, we need to make this brief excursion. The Greek term for interpretes, interpreter derives from the name of the messenger god Hermes. The messenger of the god Hermes, known as Mercury to the Romans. Hermes, and Hermes the Greek is the word we're going to use, the Greek term for messenger is angelos.
which in English is A double G becomes N G E L O S. We drop off the ending O S and we get the word angel, which comes from the Greek word for a message, the angelia. And the English term angel is a transliteration. A translation would have been messenger. A transliteration is the Greek into our alphabet and we get a transliteration of the Greek New Testament. Wings are associated with Hermes, the winged messenger of the gods who would deliver the divine message speedily to humanity. The Roman version of Mercury was always pictured with wings on his feet. And we see that picture. In fact, Mercury's winged feet became the logo for FTD, the Flores Transworld Des Delivery Service. It is said to be the most widely recognized floral symbol in the world. The feet with the wings on the ankles. For florists, the wings represent the speed of their delivery. In the New Testament, it is not the messenger, nor the speed of the messenger, but the message and the divine origin of the message that angelic messengers represent. However, the ancient Greeks, ancient Greek philosophers understood Hermes differently. So, how did the world understand the translating process differently than we do when we read the Greek Bible ourselves. They help us, the philosophers, to understand the original meaning of this word and to understand as well the way the meaning of that word has changed over time. For example, Plato, and your dates are there, in the late the 400s dying in the 300s BC Plato gives us the original meaning of the hermeneut the interpreter when he speaks of poets as these lovely poems are not of man or human workmanship but are divine and from the gods and the poets are nothing but the hermeneutes, the interpreters of the gods. Plato is saying that poetry is of divine origin. It is a message coming from the gods and the poet is the hermeneute who is hearing, experiencing the event from the gods of the message, the poem, who then put it on paper and begin then to translate it into language that is understandable to an audience. So the one who has the experience and translates that into human words is a hermeneut, according to Plato, an interpreter of what the gods are saying in the event. In much the same way that Frank Sinatra and Michael Boulé, Bablé do not write songs, but sing songs others have written in Plato's time, these did not write poetry, but they recited the poems the poets had written. So what we have here then is we're going to have the gods saying the poem. You're going to have the poet 
who hears the gods, who then puts it into writing, so that then we have somebody who gets to sing the poem, sing the song. In this case, the rhapsodies are the singers. So you've got the poet, who is the hermeneut, interpreting God here in the writing, and then the rhapsodies are then passing that message on, and in a certain way, interpreting how to do the song. You know, Frank Sinatra was a great interpreter, as Michael Buble is, of the songs that someone else has written. This making known is a making explicit. The differences between what is being made known and what is already commonly known. In other words, if we have this in writing, we have a translation of what the poet heard the divine God saying, the poem, but the rhapsodies now add their interpretation in how they sing it, the pace in which they sing it, the words they emphasize, how they linger here or there. We know many different artists, uh, uh, many different ones have sung the same song, and there are certain verses, I like the way this one did it better, they are interpreting the song emotionally differently. They're making known to us sometimes, ah, oh, I never understood it quite that way. So for Plato, there is the event, the gods, wishing to make something known, the message to mankind. There is the hermeneut, the messenger, by which the message is translated into human language that conveys the meaning of the initiating event. Therefore, there is the event, the words translating the event, and the meaning of the words convey the originating event. An event translated into words understandable by someone about the original event. The shape and color of the letters we both see and we know. We hear at the same time now and, and, and know the rising and falling of the accents, but we neither perceive by sight and hearing, nor yet know what a schoolmaster or the interpreter could actually tell us about those words. For Plato, you see, hermeneutics interpretation is the announcement and making known of the being, the existence of a being in its being in relationship to me. The hermeneut is making known the existence of a being as that being exists in relationship to me, as that being exists in relationship to us. Let that soak in. The hermeneut, the interpreter, is making known the existence of a being as that being exists in relationship to you, to me. If, if that's too many beings, beings and beings, perhaps this will help. Hermeneutic is the announcement and making known of the existence of a being 
existing in relationship to us. Or you might say hermeneutics is the announcement and making known the existence of God in his existing relationship to each one of us. We're not making known something about the identity and nature of God in isolation. We're only making known the existence of this God in relationship with us. Hermeneutics, therefore, is not simply making the existence of God known. Hermeneutics makes known the God who exists by existing in relationship with us. In terms of Newton's apple, the hermeneut, Newton, makes known the existence of gravity as it, gravity, exists in relationship with us. Newton makes known the existence of invisible gravity as invisible gravity exists in relationship with us. That is, the visible falling of the visible apple reveals this is how gravity exists in relationship with us. Newton is the hermeneut making known how gravity exists in its relationship with us. However, I must confess, I need a hermeneut, an interpreter, to make known to me in my language what the hermeneut Newton said in the first place. I need a hermeneut of the hermeneut. I need an interpreter of the interpreter to explain what Newton said gravity is in its relationship with us. But Aristotle, page 12. I know we're moving quickly. We must move quickly in order to get through the material or we will be here not at the end of August, but still at Christmas time, and we don't want that. At least those of you watching can stop the tape at any time and can chew on and mull over and absorb, absorb what it is we're speaking of. Page 12, but Aristotle. For Plato, reality was a duality of the invisible entities which express themselves as visible objects knowable by mankind. Reality is bifurcated, twofold, visible and invisible. The task for Hermes, the interpreter, making known what the God said, making that known to mankind, as Plato saw it, was to make known the invisible which was present in and expressing itself in the visible. Making known the invisible that was present and expressing its relationship to us via vis 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 the physical. Plato recognized two faculties two modes, two different ways of knowing. I know this is abstract, but we can hang in there and get this. One way, of course, was rational cognition. I recognize with my eyes or with my hands, with our senses, what something is. Rational cognition derived from our knowledge, which is derived from our senses. Our second way of knowing is cognitive intuition, a knowing that is derived through a form of 
initiation, something that is realized and hence able to know in an absolute way through the direct intuition of the divine and invisible realities themselves. For Plato then, hermeneutics, the hermeneutics task, included making known and announcing to mankind via human thought and human words, making known both the visible and especially the invisible, which was inseparably, interpenetratedly present and making itself known in the visible. There is the visible and the invisible interpenetratedly existing together simultaneously. Aristotle in the 300s BC died in 322. On the other hand was unable to visualize the existence of these invisible entities apart from the visible sensible object. Welcome to the 21st century, back in the 4th century BC. Aristotle created a philosophy which amounts to an exteriorization, looking at the exterior of things, denying as it were an invisible interior that it existed for visible objects. Aristotle focused human thought on the visible exterior. What you see is what you get. This exteriorization of thought led to a shift in hermeneutics with nothing invisible manifesting itself visibly which is what Aristotle, that was his starting point. There is nothing invisible making itself known. Therefore, Aristotle only concentrated on the visible. When speaking of the human tongue, for example, Aristotle said, living beings use their tongue for tasting as well as for conversing as they go about their dealings. In this translation I just read, conversing, as they are conversing with one another, translates the Greek term hermeneutics in a verbal form, hermeneuticizing. It is humans hermeneuticizing, talking about the visible, its interpretation of the visible is now what hermeneutics became. For Aristotle, hermeneutics is a human function of conversation between humans making the world known to each other. A discourse about something is designed to indicate the advantageous and the harmful, whatever this is good about this and whatever is bad about this, and therefore what is right and what is wrong. That is the hermeneutical conversation makes known what is visibly, openly manifest, openly understood. Do you see this? Let me explain this to you. It's accessible for our seeing and having it in its usefulness or its hurtfulness. Let me make clear exactly what you're looking at here. I can explain the visible to you. We're on this page. Here's how the, the structure works. Since I can explain uh, the, the, the structure without dealing with any of the content. With no invisible reality to make known, according to Aristotle, Hermes, the hermeneut, 
now reveal the meaning of language. Language is making something known through words. Visible reality is understandable in human words and can make known the reality itself. Human words can make known visible reality. Our words do not simply make known that there is a particular reality. Our words encompass, circumvent, and are equal to the reality they make known. Aha, literal, this word equals that. Our words therefore become a substitute for the thing itself. This is a bird, this is a chicken, this is a dog. We can have a picture and we teach our children to say dog. What is this? Cat. This picture, this equals dog. Dog equals this. Equal, what, quite literal then, our words are making known literal, visible reality. Only a third of Aristotle's writings have survived. One which survived carries the title in English on interpretation. The Greek title in the Greek language is on hermeneutics. This book deals with human reason in terms of its basic accomplishment of uncovering and making us familiar with what was covered we didn't notice in the visible when we looked at it. Thus human reason, human conversation, discourse, hermeneutics possesses the distinctive possibility of being true, making what was previously concealed about a physical object covered up available now as unconcealed. That's as if you've got a package under the Christmas tree and when you remove the wrapping you now know what the package is now out in the open. What our conversation accomplishes, what our discourse accomplishes, is making something accessible as being out there in the open, as being available and accessible to us. Now that's part of what happens when we teach. We're trying to make accessible something to us. Right now I'm trying to make accessible to you what it is to be a hermeneut. We're going to get a little further and we'll see the difference between Plato and Aristotle on this. So there is, only for Aristotle, words equal the reality back and forth and is being accomplished. Aristotle began only with the physical and sought to explain what was taking place within the physical world. In his five group history of animals, Aristotle classified all living creatures. All of us in perhaps the ninth grade or is it the eighth grade had biology where we learned the classification system which I no longer remember and perhaps most of us no longer remember as well. It came from Aristotle. He invented it. In his little book Poetics he identified the structure of a poetry, structure of a play, structure of a story and its parts. It must have an introduction, a middle, and a conclusion. In his book Politics, he identified the purpose of humans forming cities, the polis, and identified mankind as the polis creature, the political animal, the builder of the cities, that the goal of mankind was to create cities and be an urbanite.
to live in an urban setting. Both Plato and Aristotle did not accept the visible at face value as if what we see outward is all there is to be seen or known. Plato sought to understand the invisible that manifested itself in the physical. Aristotle, on the other hand, sought to understand the inner structure of the physical item itself, the inner structure of a poem, the inner structure of uh, living things in a classification system. That was Aristotle's goal of being a hermeneut. Well, that probably brings us to a nice stopping point at this moment. So why don't we stop now and take a quick break. We'll come back in just a few minutes and we'll continue on for a little more together this time. Thank you. We'll be right back. Well, welcome back to part two of our first session together. I think we're on purge to about 14 in our rough draft book. A hermeneutical shift. A hermeneutical shift. The shift from making known the invisible manifested in the visible to making known the internal relationship of the physical parts within the physical, the shift from Plato to Aristotle was a hermeneutical shift. Hermeneutics was no longer about being a messenger of the gods. Hermeneutics now explained the relationship of the parts to its whole. This hermeneutical shift eventually created a massive anthropological and epistemological shift. <laughs> wow! What long words. I know we already have a headache and I saw some of us needing some excedrins <laughs> during the break. Anthropological, our understanding of being human and epistemological, our understanding of what knowledge is and how we know the things that we know. A shift in the self-understanding of what is human and a shift in what was human, humanly knowable. The historical progression of the cultural shift from Plato to Aristotle occurred over a thousand year period in the West from 400 BC to approximately 1400 AD. The, thousand, the decisive turning point occurred in 1204 AD with the sack of Constantinople in the Fourth Crusade. The victorious crusaders returned to Venice with the gold, the silver, the art, and the cultural expressions, and the writings of Aristotle. The Greek artisans and Greek scholars came with them from Constantinople to Venice, the Italian Renaissance of the 14th century would result. The shift from a Platonic hermeneutic to a hermeneutic created a seismic shift in Western culture. Medieval Europe created in part by a Platonic hermeneutic understanding of the world. God gave way to the Renaissance, the Reformation, and the creation of modern Western culture, which now used an Aristotelian hermeneutic and understanding of the world. 
For example there, and I think you've got a diagram on page 15, that illustrates the shift so that originally under the platonic you see there was an event, the mystery, there was the hermeneut, 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 <laughs> I'll spell it right if I think, hermeneut, who then created words, we'll call it the text, that then a person got to read the text for the purpose of thinking about the invisible, uh, thinking about gravity. What is gravity, if you will? You get the point. It's to lead humanity to the event, the one sending the message in the first place. This would have been a platonic hermeneutic. A platonic hermeneutic is going to be the invisible making itself known to a hermeneut who puts it in writing, tells somebody about it with their words verbally so that this person might have an encounter with the invisible one themselves. This is going to give way to the Aristotelian hermeneutic, which has only not a mystery in that sense, just simply the physical. I guess I should put it down here, but the camera may not be able to see it. You have the physical. The hermeneut now translates that to this, so that we now sense words equal the thing so that if this is a picture of a of a cat uh, whiskers a cat that equals cat so I no longer need an experience with this I have this I have words so that I now can then write my own text, say something to with my words, with these words, for the purpose of giving it to a person. But there's never coming back to this. The words now are what's important to our conversation back and forth together. And so you only have the physical with its interpretations of the physical within, if this is the first interpretation, and then this person, since this isn't going to happen, the goal of this person is to now be an interpreter with their words, their text, to then tell somebody else, and then this person is going to give their, well, this is what I think it means, and this is what I think it means. And so that by the 21st century, our academic world has been reduced to studying what this author said about it versus what that author said about it, what that one said. And after you've read all of the literature on it, you're supposed to say, this is what I think. And so you create yet a new. So we're always adding on here to a new one, to a new one, to a new one, and nobody ever gets back to here with the original and begins to say, let's just start here and come forward again. Which gives us then hermeneutical scholasticism on page 17. The shift from the invisible to the visible from the interior to the exterior resulted in a shift with the understanding of books and written material. Ancient authors were no longer understood to have used words to point towards an invisible reality. Their words were now reality itself. 
a word or combination of words now means something. Ha <laughs> word means something. Hermeneutes were no longer messengers, interpreters of the gods. They were interpreters of a text, even a biblical text. Aristotle understood Aristotle's way. Newton's apple was not an invisible reality, gravity manifesting itself in the physical act of a falling apple. Newton was not translating an invisible entity speaking, as it were. He was explaining the meaning of a falling apple. He explained the individual parts relating to each other to create the whole picture. In this case, the whole is gravity. He put into words the relationship he saw every body, single items in the universe is attracted to every other body with a force. <laughs> I wonder what a force is. That is directly proportional to the product of their masses and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. I still don't understand. Newton translated the meaning of a falling apple into the language of physics. I do not speak that language. Therefore, I need an interpreter to tell me in simple English what Newton said. I need an interpreter of the interpreter. That would be, here's one, I need a second one, and maybe a third one, or I'm up here, and maybe by the time you got to this one, you finally got one I could understand. After the Renaissance, the West, in the West, knowledge now came from authors who wrote books. Authors were authorities. Isn't that where the word comes from? Here is an author. You write a book, and you write more than one book especially, and you are now an authority. It's in a book. You are the hermeneut who put it into writing, and somehow that becomes an end in itself. Society, not speaking the language of academics, needed those who could explain what Plato had said, and what Aristotle meant. More books were written explaining what ancient authors meant. Generation after generation of authors explained what previous authors had said about previous authors. In the academic world, one's bibliography defines one's scholarship Specifically, then, we come to Martin Luther on page 17. Elsewhere, I have discussed at length Martin Luther's break with Roman Catholicism and his creating a book as his authority to replace the authority of the Catholic Church. You might see my book, Here I Stand, Luther versus Peter. Luther's Bible became the authority of Luther's church. Luther's protest against the Roman Catholic Church was for their switch from Augustine, who made use of Plato, to Aquinas, who made use of Aristotle. He was fighting over the hermeneutical shift. But in an ironic twist, Luther rejected theology based on Aristotle, but embraced the hermeneutical shift from Plato to the new Aristotelian hermeneutic by creating a book. Luther became an interpreter of an interpreter. 
he wrote his own interpretation of the book he had invented. Within Aristotelian hermeneutic, the religious scriptures of the ancient Israelites and Christianity no longer pointed to the invisible God to which the writings pointed as their source. Luther's De Bibel plus Luther's interpretation of it became the sole authority. Not the God who originated the event, the Bible now becomes the soul of the, the book, the text. The biblical text no longer pointed to experiencing the God of Israel or Christianity. The Bible, the biblical text, became the thing in itself. It pointed to itself. Sola Scriptura, faith in Scripture alone, made sure of that. With its text alone, the Bible alone, the Protestant Reformation began to splinter and divide over the meaning of words. Protestants accepted the biblical text. That made them Protestants. Interpretations divided the Protestants into denominations. Protestants could all shout, the Bible says, but they could not agree on what it meant. With the text replacing the gods, the text now became God and scholasticism was born. How grand education, eschewing obfuscation, reality, how absurd. Four letters make a bird, B-I-R-D. Aristotle's hermeneutic not only created the text as an end in itself, his hermeneutic created a world with walls, but no windows. There was no one behind the wall, behind the curtain, not even a good man being a bad wizard. The world was filled with pretty houses and no one was home. We collected conch shells by the sea, vacant and empty of the life that created them. There was no invisible presence. With our microscopes and our telescopes, generation after generation performed their autopsies on the corpse of the physical world that we parasitically call home. We invented magical gadgets to keep us entertained lest we noticed there was no interior, no point, no meaning, no one home in the hollow and empty void of Aristotle's world. There was only stuff, lots of dead, lifeless stuff. Shakespeare's lonely stage where all the men and women are merely players. They have their exits and their entrances and one man in his time plays many parts. Life is nothing but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. Where Plato's hermeneutic had filled the world with light and life, mystery, 
Aristotle gave us four walls, a floor and a ceiling, a claustrophobic world of our five senses. Welcome to the 21st century. If we approach the mystagogic liturgy from Aristotle's point of view, then we only have visible physical parts and its movement to try and explain in terms of their relationship with each other. This is here, this is that, this relates to that. We just have moving parts. There's no one home. However, if we approach the divine liturgy as pointing us to experiencing the presence in the burning bush for ourselves, then we approach the divine liturgy as a mystagogic liturgy. As we continue, we shall learn how to think mystagogic, mystagogically, how to approach life mystagogic, how to worship mystagogic in the mystagogic liturgy. That's what lies ahead for us. I realize we've started heavy hermeneutics, epistemology, wow. We continue to escape from Western Aristotelian locked in a box without windows in order to be able to enter into the experience of the divine liturgy which is filled with light and windows everywhere. God bless you for being part as we start this journey together. God willing, we'll be back next week as we look at episode number two. Thank you. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Trinity, one in essence and undivided.